Thanks so much, Chris. For It feels like a reality TV program here with um, everyone getting very excited uh, and no pressure with that introduction, but thank you. Uh, and I, I actually thought I'd, I was, when Chris called me, I thought, God, 30 years ago, I was at the science school. And then I went, oh, 40 years ago. Uh, and I felt very, very old. But it was such a memorable time. Um, I found, dug out this, this photo, that's me up there with sort of longer hair. Um, at the science school, and I still am friends with people that I met uh, during that two weeks. We stayed at Cranbrook, out at Rose Bay. Uh, it was just an amazing experience, um, but at that time it was run by Harry Messel, um, after whom this, what this lecture theatre is named, uh, and Julius Sumner Miller, who was a very famous physicist. Um, and so I'm going to give you, I actually realised that some of my talks today I do touch back to times before you all were born, um, but it does give you a little bit of a feeling and a setting for the stuff that I want to talk about. This morning I'm going to give you a Cook's tour of genomics and precision medicine. Um, what's, what's happened, its recent history and where we're going into the future, because that's certainly a big area where I work at the moment. Um, and then this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about a research, uh, my research, personal research passion. Um, that I've been working on for around 25 years, which relates to genes that influence elite athletic performance. So two different areas, but they're, they're tied together by the need to understand our genetic makeup um, and what makes us all unique individuals. So just to give you a little bit of my ancient history, um, I grew up in Newcastle, which is about two hours north of here. I went to Newcastle Girls High School, so I was the NGHS science school representative for that year. Um, then I actually trained and moved to Sydney to this university where I, I studied medicine. Um, and this is, a, I thought, a lovely old photo of the, the quadrangle, the Bosch Lecture Theatre, which is just down the road, and I lived in Women's College for a couple of years, which is where I believe you're having lunch. Um, <laughs> this is me going to work at the Children's Hospital, the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children... Not, not really, this is a joke. I just realised they didn't laugh. Um, the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children, which used to be down the road. Um, you can still see the facade of this hospital um, just down Ross Street. And uh, the Children's Hospital in the mid-90s was actually moved out to Westmead, where it's now the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, but when I first did my research, uh, I did it um, very much focused on, on birth defects in children. Um, because during my study of medicine, I'd gone straight from high school into undergraduate medicine, and it was a five-year course. They didn't have gap years in those days. Uh, and by, after about three years of studying medicine, having studied really hard at school as well, you can sometimes get a bit exhausted by the continual grind um, related to studying. And so in the middle of my medicine degree, um, my mum, there's no way she would have let me take a year off, um, and as I said, gap years weren't common, so I did um, a Bachelor of Science in Medicine degree uh, where I focused on causes of birth defects in children because it was just an area that fascinated me. Uh, and I must say it was during that year I just got addicted to doing research at the same time that I was doing medicine. Uh, and that's probably one of the big messages I would give you. If you find something that absolutely excites you and thrills you, then stick at it and think about the way you can incorporate that into your career. Uh, because, you know, it's, I'm a person who's easily bored and I am never bored in what I do at work, which I think is a wonderful, a wonderful thing to say. So um, after I did my, uh, after I finished medicine, um, I went to the children's hospital and trained to become a paediatrician. And then I trained in um, child neurology because I was very interested in the nervous system. And also, I really liked uh, one of the senior neurologists when I went and saw um, how they taught medical students and brought patients in. This guy could do um, a ventriloquist act projecting a Donald Duck voice. And the children would be looking around to see where Donald Duck was. And I thought, I'd like to be like that guy. I think um, that was, he was such an entertaining person working with children. And again, that's another piece of advice I'd give you when you see someone that you think, I'd like to be like that when I grow up. It can often, it's, I've often made career decisions uh, based on that as well. 
So I trained in child neurology and did a doctorate in um, inherited neurological disorders and then went over and worked at the Children's Hospital in Boston and did the genetics program at Harvard Medical School. And that was a bit of serendipity actually, because I was going to go overseas and train in neurology. Um, but while I was over there, I met up with some people I'd been corresponding with around the disease I did my doctorate on. And um, as we sat over lunch, and I'd just done a series of interviews, he said, why are you coming here to do neurology? You've done neurology. Why don't you come and do genetics? Because that's really going to add to your skill set. I thought, well, that's, that's actually quite a good idea. And did another series of interviews and ended up um, doing genetics, which is a bit ironic because that's very much what I do in the, in the mainframe um, ever since. So the story of genomics very much parallels um, the history of the developments in IT and compute. So the two have gone hand in hand. So I tried to put a personal touch onto this. This was when I did that BSc Med um, in 1982 at um, the university and, and at here and down at the Children's Hospital. And literally my thesis from that, which was about thalidomide and birth defects and inherited birth defects, uh, my mum typed, <laughs> typed up my thesis. I literally read it, edited it, we cut and pasted it, and then she retyped it on her electric typewriter. By the time I was doing my doctorate, I had this beautiful computer, a 286 with a floppy disk drive, um, and the capacity of that is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous um, how technology and what's on our mobile phones now has increased. When I was doing my postdoc in genetics, um, in Boston, I did a, an amazing two-week course on genetics, and this was in the middle of what I'll also be talking about, the Human Genome Project had just started. And we did these various clinics, and one afternoon, it was a bit like science school, but for genetics nerds, and they brought in all the experts around the world to talk about what was happening in genetics. Um, and then one afternoon, we did a, a computer clinic. And at that time, they introduced us to this thing called the World Wide Web which they thought might make, um, have an impact on genetics into the future, um, as well as quite a few other things. So that was my first introduction to the World Wide Web. From Boston, I came back to the Children's Hospital at Westmead, um, which is about 20 kilometres um, west of here, out at Westmead. And basically, because of my training in neurology and in genetics, um, it was, I, I set up a neurogenetic service, which is a clinical service for kids that had inherited neurological disorders, with a particular focus on two areas. Um, one was the one I did my doctorate on, a disorder called neurofibromatosis, which is an inherited uh, cancer predisposition syndrome. Uh, and then where I sort of gained a lot of interest, uh, which was in inherited muscle diseases like muscular dystrophies. And that's, um, so we, that were the sort of two major areas. And I developed a research laboratory um, that started to look at gene discovery um, for kids with neuromuscular disease. So that's a very, very quick potted history to the start of where I started doing some research and starting to apply genetics um, to the study of um, kids' disorders. This was back in 1996. And this is the range of disorders um, that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about just to set the scene about how the field has changed. All of these kids have one thing in common. They have problems with their muscles. Some of them present um, as floppy infants at birth. Um, some of these kids are never able to walk. Some of these kids can walk initially, but then their muscles start to deteriorate and get re replaced by scar tissue, which is what muscular dystrophy is. But it's not just about not being able to walk or losing the ability to walk. We have a number of other muscles in our body. We have the muscles of breathing. And a lot of these kids get respiratory failure. And that's often what they die of. Some of these kids die in the first year of life because their breathing muscles don't work. And you can see this little girl here has a disorder called spinal muscular atrophy. And you can see the deformity in her chest because her muscles of breathing are not working properly. And she actually died of respiratory failure or lung failure, breathing failure by the end of her first year of life. The heart is also a muscle, and in some neuromuscular disorders, the heart muscle is involved as well, and you can get um, cardiac failure. 
So these are dreadful disorders um, that when I started working in this field, uh, or set up my own clinic uh, in 1996, so that's you know, over 20 years ago, um, we could probably give a definite diagnosis in about one in 10 cases. The other nine in 10, we could not tell the parents why their kid couldn't walk, why they weren't developing properly, or why they were dying early of respiratory failure. And imagine if you're a parent with a kid presenting with that problem. Let alone, what can I expect for the future? What do I expect for my other children? What are the risks to my other children? What can you do about it? A diagnosis is necessary to be able to answer all of those questions. So that's where we were in 1996. One in 10, no therapies, couldn't give answers for most patients. So let me just set the scene. So that's, I'm now gonna talk about what's happened in the next 20 years that genomics has contributed to. So this is what I call your oldie diagnostic flow chart. This is how we used to do it in the old days up to 2012. Basically, we'd see the patient, we'd assess them clinically, get their family history, which is very important in terms of genetic risk. We'd do other blood tests. We'd always take a muscle biopsy. That was our first line test. So the kid would come in, have an anesthetic, stay in hospital, have a muscle biopsy. And then we'd look at the um, expression of different muscle proteins to see if they were there or not. Because the, like the most common forms of muscle disease Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example, is due to an absence of a protein called dystrophin, which is a major player in protecting muscle from damage. Um, we quantitated um, the protein in the muscle, that's what a Western blot is. Um, and then, then, down the bottom, we went to gene sequencing. Now, think back 1996, human genome wasn't sequenced. Sequencing a gene, believe me, um, can take a month to sequence a single gene because you're doing the bits of it, the exons one by one in a very long, laborious process. And again, as new genes were discovered, we'd sequence those, or we ourselves would contribute to the discovery of genes. Um, but it was a very long and laborious process. So the disorders, the, the little family I'm gonna to talk to you about um, had a disorder of muscle development that's called a congenital myopathy. And I'm gonna show you this, this, this slide makes me sad because you're gonna see that we don't need to do these muscle biopsies anymore. Whereas I, I think a muscle biopsy is a thing of beauty in terms of giving you a diagnosis. And we describe these disorders based on um, various things that we'd see in the muscle. So the cause that you can see these areas where the mitochondria are not present in the center of the muscle. Um, and this was called a centronuclear myopathy where the, the nuclei are usually around the outside of a muscle biopsy. This is, if you think of muscle, uh, muscle is a long series of fibers. Think of it like tubular spaghetti or spaghetti. So, and that's how your muscle contracts that way. When you turn it end on and cut across like that, you're looking down at the tops of all the individual bits of spaghetti, which are the individual muscle fibers. And that's what we're looking at here. Because you're gonna see a couple of those this morning and this afternoon. So you're looking end on in cross section at the, at the actual muscle fibers. But the disorder that's been a particular interest of mine is this one called memeline myopathy, where these individual muscle fibers contain um, these abnormal inclusions. And nema is Greek for thread or rod. So these little thread rod-like structures within the muscle fiber is how we sort of lump these together from a diagnostic perspective. When I started my lab in 1996, this was the list of congenital myopathies and the genes that we had for them. So we knew two genes. Then by the, the 2012, which is the sort of period of time before we were able to actually start to use the new technologies related to genomic testing, we'd actually, by doing one by one, been able to contribute to the discovery of a whole range of different genes using that the oldie genetic sort of approach um, that was very painstaking. And for each of these genes, it was obviously usually three to five years of work to actually find one of them. 
So this is a family I want to talk to you about that has this nemaline myopathy. And these little rods are actually composed of this tissue. This is uh, an electron microscope of what a muscle looks like. So it's the individual contractile bits of the muscle. When I say to you, like, muscle contracts like that, each bit is composed of what is known as a sarcomere, where you've got thin and thick fibres that interweave with each other, and every muscle contraction goes like that. So these bits here are the bits that interweave to contract, and then they're lined up down here by this protein called alpha-actinin, which sort of lines them all up and maintains that very ordered array or that very ordered structure of muscle fibres. And remember alpha-actinin, because I'm going to talk about that this afternoon when I talk about athletes. And the rods um, that were in nemaline myopathy are an accumulation of this deadline material that's keeping that muscle in order. So the muscle then starts to become disordered. It doesn't, um, bits of it break down. It doesn't contract properly. And these kids have marked muscle weakness. And you can see this little girl's got facial muscle weakness as well. This is Eliza. Um, she can't close her mouth properly. That obviously affects her speech. Um, she spent the first nine months of her life in the intensive care unit because she had problems with both swallowing, which involves muscles, and her breathing, as I talked about. So this is her in the intensive care unit. As a very sick little baby, you can see her facial, facial weakness um, had to be fed through a tube. But um, we had found from studying a lot of these kids that if you really um, looked after them and gave them a lot of support during the first year or two of life, um, they would live. They would actually get better, a bit better as they got older. And this is Eliza starting to learn to walk when she was about four years of age. I think she walked independently when she was about seven. So this one's not a progressive disorder, um, but it's still associated with a lot of disability, problems with the breathing and feeding. They're often in hospital. Every time they get one of the colds that you're being protected um, because of your hand washing, they'd end up in hospital in intensive care because they'd, uh, it would tip them over the edge from a breathing perspective. So in my lab, my research lab at the Children's Hospital, we needed a number of genetic in investigations from the time I first met Eliza in 2005 to um, th over the next five years. We took biopsies of her muscle. And this is showing, you see, you can see those regular sort of units, the sarcomere of the muscle that I talked to you about. And this is just stained with um, actin, which is a major um, part of muscle. You can see these rods um, actually staining with alpha-actinin. These are the, the rods that we see in these kids. This is what the rods look like on electron microscopy. And these look like little caterpillars. That's a collection of that material, that alpha-actinin within the muscle. And then it's all little hairy, thin filaments coming off it that then haven't formed properly. So this was the pathology that we were seeing. We did extensive... Pro because this wasn't known to, uh, associated with any of the known genes. And we went through, and as the genes were discovered, we sequenced them in this family to see if they were the cause of the problem. Um, but we came up with no genetic diagnosis. So we had the two parents who'd gone through IVF um, to have Eliza. Um, they were really wanting to have another child, but we couldn't give them an answer about what the risk, what this was, what was causing it, what the risk was going to be to other children. We couldn't provide prenatal diagnosis to look at the risk for their future babies. Uh, we couldn't provide an answer. So after this five years though, they decided that they would take the risk and that they would have another baby. And we were, our guesstimate was that there would be a one in four risk um, of them having another child with nemaline myopathy. Uh, and, but we couldn't, we couldn't be certain because we didn't know the specific diagnosis. And you'll see what happened. This was her little sister. Um, little sister Sarah was born, and it was just obvious from day one <laughs> that um, she was affected with the same disorder as Eliza. So these parents now had these two, the, you know, normally intelligent children, but very disabled by their muscle problem. So this is what it was like in the era where you couldn't get a specific diagnosis and parents were sort of playing roulette 
um, when it, reproductive roulette when it came to um, whether or not they pr predict for future pregnancies. Meanwhile, the Human Genome Project was happening. So as I said, it started um, in 1990. It was just underway when I was at the, doing my training in, in Boston. Um, and it involved 20 labs around the world. It was led by this guy, Francis Collins, and, um, uh, and uh, Craig Venter. They were sort of in a race to see who could sequence the human genome first. And, um, but they, it was called a tie in the end, a bit like the World Cup last night. And uh, there's 20 laboratories um, around the world. It took 13 years, and it cost US $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. Now, a genome, all that means is all of the genes. So we have about 20,000 genes. They're a part of our DNA. That, that sort of recipe book is in every single cell in our body, and it makes us who we are. Mistakes in the genes um, are associated with genetic disorders. Um, genetic alterations are also associated with different types of cancer, but genetic variation is what makes us all look different and act different and have susceptibility um, to different types of disorders. But $3 billion and 13 years, it was huge. And again, in parallel with that, it was dealing with this huge amount of information and the IT and the compute that was needed to be able to interpret that. Three billion base pairs um, in, a, a, in a single human genome. So uh, I just love this though. I remember in 2005 hearing Francis Collins speak. And his comment was that the Human Genome Project means that scientists in small labs anywhere can do big science and make big discoveries because um, they made the human genome initially freely accessible through that thing, the World Wide Web. So the first human genome, the single one, came out in 2003. Um, and it really had built on a whole heap of different um, genetic and informatic um, advances in science. And then the technology continued to advance to see how quickly we could sequence, you know, <laughs> could we get it less than 13 years, basically, because that's not very useful from a diagnostic perspective, and neither is the cost of $3 billion. Uh, and so that really has fed into what's been happening ever since, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. By 2012, there was the ability and the technology, and I'll come back to this, for the rapid sequencing of all the genes. The genome is all 20,000 odd genes and the bits in between, the introns, which are regulatory areas. It was becoming quicker and cheaper. And at that stage in my lab, because that's where we're up to with Eliza and Sarah's story. Um, I collaborated with actually <clears throat> Daniel and Monkel, were both over in Boston at this stage at Harvard and at the Broad Institute. And Daniel and Monkel were my PhD students who worked on the gene that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. And as all good students, they gave back to their PhD supervisor. And we set up a collaboration using this new technology <clears throat> to see if we could use it to solve these kids where we didn't have a diagnosis with neuromuscular disease. By this stage, by 2012, we're up, probably up to about 20 to 25% diagnostic rates just by those genes that we'd sequenced using the, the very older and slower methods. Okay. So, <clears throat> Eliza and Sarah, this was part of a project where we're aiming to look at 200 families with neuromuscular disease. But Eliza and Sarah were family number one in, in this project that we were doing in collaboration with Boston. Um, and this was the family tree, unaffected parents, two affected kids. That tells you pretty much that it's likely to be what's known as a recessive disorder, where each parent is a carrier um, for, for the abnormal gene and the kids unluckily get both copies of the abnormal gene. So we... This was the first family that we applied whole exome sequencing to. I thought exomes is just the coding region of the gene. It's a little bit more, uh, it's a bit, at that stage it was a bit quicker and cost effective than doing all the bits in between as well, but we can discuss that if we wish in question time. 
And what we found was variations in this gene called LMOD3 <coughs> that looked like the most likely cause, this was after a fair amount of bioinformatic analysis, that looked like a potential cause for the disease. Now, there'd been no disease described associated with this particular gene. We confirmed it by sort of more conventional sequencing. We showed that these two kids both had two abnormal copies. Each parent just carried, that were unaffected, just carried one normal copy. So that, that was consistent with what would lead to a recessive disease in this family. But that doesn't prove that it causes the disease. And remember that, because this afternoon, I'll talk about a situation where we proved something didn't cause a disease by doing these sort of studies I'm about to talk about. So why did we think that this was a good candidate disease gene? I'm just gonna go through this so you, see, you can see what we have to go through to prove that something actually causes disease before, as a clinician, I can say, this is the reason your child has this muscle weakness. First of all, we looked at what I call biological plausibility. So LMOD, Lyomodin, had not been associated with any human disease before, um, but the protein had been described um, a couple of years previously, um, or one that was related to Lyomodin 3, that actually formed that it showed that it was present in actin filaments in muscle cells. Now, you remember, I've talked to you about the actin filaments that intertwine in terms of when you get muscle contraction. So this was a protein that was in the right place to be, um, to be associated with muscle dysfunction if it wasn't working properly. And the other genes at that stage that we'd found for nemaline myopathy did contribute um, to the actin filament itself. In fact, mutations in actin itself can cause nemaline myopathy or the regulation or the stability of those actin filaments. So, you know, it was certainly a gene that was in the right pathway in the right area for us to think this is causing the disease. But then we can't just make a conclusion based on one family because, you know, who knows what we've missed or what else might be affecting the disease in this family. And so at this stage in 2012, um, we need to then find other cases. And nemaline myopathy is a very rare disease. It affects about one in 100,000 children. So if this is a rare cause of a rare disease, then it's not going to be easy to find. We sequenced and looked at all of our other unknown cases in Australia um, and didn't find another case. So as I said, the way that we looked for other um, cases of this at that stage, and I'll show you later what we do now, was to email my mates around the world who worked on this disease. And we actually, by emailing, <laughs> emailing my mates, um, we uh, identified another 540 cases of nemaline myopathy around the world. I, I encouraged them all to sequence this particular gene. And we came up with an additional, seven, whoop, an additional 17 patients from 12 additional families around the world that had mutations in LMOD3 and had nemaline myopathy. So that's sort of nailing it to say this is the disease gene. This is the table. You can see we've got the one from Sydney. Then we had some for four families from Japan, Portugal, France, Italy, US, Finland. Um, looking at rare diseases is an international collaborative effort because it can be hard, in, it can be hard to find these single cases. You need to pull knowledge from around the world to be able to answer a question for one specific family. And that's the principle of genomics that I'm gonna keep coming back to because we're dealing with a huge amount of information. How do we make an accurate prediction for an individual? What we found from then looking at all of these um, different uh, families was some common things. Um, most of them had a very severe nemaline myopathy, which basically meant that um, they were abnormal from the time that they were born. Um, they had joint contractures, very severe weakness, failure to breathe properly, difficulty swallowing and feeding. In actual fact, apart from Eliza and Sarah, all of these other babies had died during the first year of life. 
from a very severe form of the disease. What we found with Eliza and Sarah is not, well, of course our medical care of them was fabulous, but what we found was that their particular mutations meant that they didn't lose all of the protein that was formed, they only they lost a bit of it. It didn't work as well as it should, but they still had a bit there that made them less severe than all these other babies who had complete loss of the LMOD3 protein. So that explained why they were able to survive. Oop. So the other thing that we did, um, and we did a lot of other experiments, but I won't, I could do a, an hour's talk on this gene, but the other thing that we did um, to demonstrate that mutations in this gene uh, actually cause disease, which is what pathogenic means, is we make animal models. And the first model we made was in a zebrafish. Um, and, so, and we do it in a zebrafish because it's quick. We can make zebrafish quickly. We make mice take months to make a mouse model. But in a zebrafish, um, the LMOD3 knockout zebrafish, uh, you can see it's got um, a different, it's, it's basically thinner and smaller. And when we actually stained for alpha actinin in this zebrafish, we actually demonstrated um, the rods, those nemaline rods within the muscle of the zebrafish. These had short bodies, bent tails. And then the other thing that you do with the zebrafish is you, you touch them with a, um, like a, a pinpoint and they dart away, whereas these, these fish were sort of paralysed. Their muscle didn't work. So that was basically demonstrating a model of nemaline myopathy using a zebrafish. So all of that information together was what we published to demonstrate um, this as a new disease gene, but also to identify it as a gene that was very, very important during normal human muscle development. Because that's the other thing that's incredibly important, is it then teaches you about normal biology and a previously unknown gene and protein that's very important for muscle to be normally formed. So after that study, remember I said that they were the first, Eliza and Sarah, in a study of over, uh, now it's at now about 250 cases of neuromuscular disease. And look at this, we've now solved 90% of cases. We can give 90% of families with nemaline myopathy an answer about what is the specific gene. Um, we can st we're starting to work on what is it we can do from a therapeutic perspective. We can offer prenatal diagnosis for future pregnancies. We can introduce them to other families with kids with the same, um, with the same issues. Uh, we can predict what, what we need to expect for the future. So this has been incredibly important. So we've gone from 10% 20 years ago to now probably sitting in some disorders, the majority, but this is, uh, and then uh, with others sitting around 50-50 diagnostic rates using this genomic testing. So that's to give you a feeling of how the use of this genomic technology, the ability to sequence all the genes more rapidly and at a, better, a, a lower cost, has influenced how me as a clinician and a scientist has applied that in my research. What I'm going to turn to now is how does this then apply to getting this into clinical practice? Because if you luck out and you'd come and see me in my clinic and my lab was working on this and I happened to have the, the good connections over in Boston at the time or you know, now we can do it in, um, uh, ourselves in Australia, um, it's still not available within the healthcare system. So a number of important things. First of all, this was, as I said, the first genome cost $3 billion and took 13 years. But the cost, along with the technology to analyze it, has come down dramatically um, over this, you know, previous, over this last 20 years or so. And I would say, the thing is, you can now sequence the whole genome for about $1,000. But, you know, sometimes it can cost tens of thousands of dollars to analyse it because if you don't get the answer the first time or by simple bioinformatics, then you, you need to do that sort of more extreme analysis that I've just shown you if it's an unknown gene. But it's getting, the, the message is it's getting quicker and it's getting more accurate. 
Um, and the, the thousand dollar cost is like the chemicals and the time. Uh, genomic medicine, I think, has gone through, and this is often with any new technology, and I quite like this, is that you, you know, you get this happening, and then we thought genomics was going to solve everything. So you get this peak of inflated expectations, but it's not true. You then go into the trough of disillusionment when it's not answering all of your problems. But I think we're actually in this slope of enlightenment and productivity at the moment in terms of how we're applying genomics um, in the health system. So the challenges are the human genome is large, about 3 billion bases. And about 1% is the coding region, all those bits that are the important parts of the content of the recipe, um, the exons. And the bits in between, um, we know a lot less about, but they're very important in terms of regulation and expression. Think of a gene as a recipe for a protein in your body. Your genome is your entire recipe book. Mutations are when there are spelling mistakes in the recipe. So if you're cooking a risotto and it says three cups of rice, but you've got a spelling mistake, so it's three cups of lice. That's going to give you a very different end product. Or um, it's, it, you can have uh, a whole ingredient missing. So if you're cooking a sponge cake, it's going to matter less if the vanilla line is missing. But if your eggs are missing, it's not going to look anything like a sponge cake. So, they're the sort of, that's what mutations are. They're mistakes in the recipe and they alter um, the, the protein or the product of that recipe. So the human genome is large. Each copy of War and Peace, the book, maybe this is the wrong crowd, has three million letters. Now, so a thousand copies of War and Peace has three billion letters, which is equivalent to a genome, which is the equivalent to a 12 story building. So that's how much information is in each of your genomes. And the problem is also is that most of it is still in Russian. We don't know what it means. We know, we probably know what half the genes do. And so that's the excitement of how we're doing our research in that area. The challenges. Um, it's also that there's a lot of very, we, we are not clones. We don't all look like each other. We all have susceptibility to different disorders. We all look different. And that's because we have variations um, between, any, between any two people in this room. Your genomes won't be exactly the same. They'll be much more similar to your parents, for example. And so part of the difficulty we have to find is what is normal variation or what is a variation that can be associated with disease. And the only way we can do that is by pooling information on millions of people to be able to make an accurate prediction for one individual. It's also been found that we have between 50 and 100 inherited disease-causing mutations, much more than we imagined. Luckily, if you just have one copy of them, you don't get disease, but we're all walking around carrying variants that potentially, if you and your partner pass those on to your kids, then you could have a kid with a rare inherited disorder. Rare. Rare disease affects one in 20 of us. So it's a misnomer, really. And it certainly is the major cause of intellectual and physical disability in children, which is obviously why I'm interested in it. So genomic medicine, what, how, do, how is it going to, you know, how do we bring this into the healthcare system? What could it mean? Faster and improved, faster diagnosis, improved outcome, better prediction. Um, in cancer, targeting therapies and precision medicine. Prevention, that's where I really want to see us being able to prevent um, these issues with these kids born with um, these dreadful disabilities. So, obviously, you know, I'm a bit of a genomic medicine junkie and I worked here and I worked at the Children's Hospital um, here until the end of 2012. And then I was um, approached about applying for the head of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, which is, um, this is the Royal Children's Hospital in um, Melbourne. And the Murdoch is the top um, two floors of this. We have over 2,000 researchers. The Victorian Clinical Genetic Service is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Uh, this was founded 
um, about 33 years ago by Dame Elizabeth Murdoch, who was a great philanthropist in Melbourne. For her sin, she's Rupert Murdoch's mother. Um, but she was an amazing, an amazing philanthropist, an amazing woman. And she worked with David Danks, who was like the grandfather of genetics in Australia, to set up and invest in the Murdoch Institute for Birth Defects. And I'm now the David Danks Professor at the University of Melbourne, so it's lovely historical um, connections. But what really attracted me to coming to work here um, is that there was an integration between the hospital, the research institute, there was just no barriers between it. It's a, you know, you walk out of a ward and into the institute, uh, which I think as a, as a clinician scientist, it's a fabulous environment in which to do research and it makes your research very relevant uh, to the patients that are within the hospital or within the community. Um, but secondly, it gave me the opportunity to start to address this question of, that, that I've raised is how do I get this ability to do this faster, rapid, but expensive diagnostic tool? How do we get this into clinical practice? And so what I'm going to talk about now is what we've been doing over the last five years to make that happen. So the last five years. Um, so the challenge that we're facing is that all of this genomic sequencing that's been happening has been happening in research labs such as mine. But it's starting to come into clinical practice because it so obviously makes a difference in terms of the information that you can give to patients and you can use. But the thing is, around the world, um, there's always millions of samples that are going to be sequenced. And the data is, you know, was typically you know, in silos. It was sitting in computers in my lab, for example, or in Boston lab. The analysis was non-standardized. You know, we had different approaches to consent, to ethics. And so at the same time that I started at the Murdoch, I actually became involved with um, a group called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And this was actually established, um, we launched it in 2014, um, but it started with Francis Collins, who headed the Human Genome Project, brought together some people from around the world and said, well, you know, we've got the human genome now. How do we, you know, what do we, <laughs> it's what you do with it, love. How do, what, what do we do with this to actually make sure that we're utilising it for human health in a coordinated way? Because you need, as I've said, information from millions of people to be able to predict precisely for a single individual. So the Global Alliance was formed or launched in 2014. No one country can do this alone. And it now has across 71 countries around the world um, with 500 institutional partners. I sit on the executive as the vice chair and I, I think one of my major roles has evolved in terms of how we share information, not just across state borders in Australia, but how we share it across country borders. And our goal is to accelerate progress in human health by establishing common frameworks to harmonise our approaches to all of this data. Think of genomics. We all need to speak, no matter which country you're in, we all need to speak the same language in terms of how we call the human genome. Otherwise, it's meaningless for us to be able to talk to each other. So we can't have a Russian and a French and a Spanish human genome. We all need to be talking about it in the same way so we can share it. So one thing that we've created um, through the Global Alliance is what's called Matchmaker Exchange. And what this is, is it's a federated platform of you know, what we'd found that around the world they were developing all of these databases that would have a clinical description, e.g. a patient with nemaline myopathy associated with a mutation in a gene, like LMOD3 that I've talked to you about. So this replaces the emailing your mates part of it. Wouldn't it be so much better if we could sit down and I could type Elmod 3 nemaline myopathy into my computer and it could ping around the world and see if any other scientist or any other clinician like me had made that association. And this is exactly what Matchmaker Exchange is now doing. It's bring instead of, it's gonna replace the emailing your mates and your collaborators and we're aiming for this to, um, so we're aiming for this to uh, actually link together all of that information so we can better predict for an individual patient. 
the um, global alliance approach is, you know, we don't invent the, the wheel. We've got to build from our existing systems. And what we're really looking at is to bring the analysis to the data because we're still in a state where data that will be stored in clouds, the cloud needs to be associated with specific countries. So we're needing to federate and analyse information where it sits. So what we're aiming for, I like to think of, is Google Genome. Because that's the dream, is that we can sit at our computer, I can type in LMOD3, and I can get all the information from all the labs around the world that may have found something about LMOD3, rather than the long and painful process that we went through. So the next five years for the Global Alliance is we figure that you know, we're going to have data of tens of millions of individuals um, are going to be, um, are going to be uh, sequenced. Um, what our Global Alliance is developing is the standards, so all of that data is interoperable and shareable and understandable. But the one thing I wanted to highlight here is that the vast majority of this data going forward is going to be generated in the healthcare system versus research lab. And that's starting to happen now. But there are huge, you know, but how do we make that happen? It just, you know, for something as complex as this, it just doesn't happen like that. And that's, um, be, and that's because we've got to think within our healthcare system, uh, we've got to have a workforce that's literate in genomics. Um, we've got the sequencing laboratories, but how do we store the data? How do we train up the pathologists? How do we get the clinicians working with the bioinformaticians, working with the diagnostic scientists? What does it do about life insurance? How does it link into an electronic medical record? What does government think about all of this? So these are the sort of very complex systems um, that we have been working with over the last three to four years. And this has been, uh, I mean, we, we're really looking at how a whole of system change is needed. And I think we started by just putting down the tracks um, as we were going along to start with the patient and see how we could build that infrastructure so that we've got bringing all of this information together. And the other thing in our country, in Australia, is we have different states. And um, there's a famous historical thing where they did lay down railway tracks, but then you had to, the train had to change line, you had to change trains at the state border because the railway tracks didn't link together from different states. So we've got to make sure that the railway tracks are linking together in all the different states. So I lead um, a group called Australian Genomics, um, Australian Genomics Health Alliance. And this was funded by our NHMRC with an initial grant of $25 million. And it's basically a big health services research project of how do we demonstrate to government, who will eventually pay for this, um, the benefits of you know, how patients might benefit from the application of genomic data to show evidence about cost effectiveness, strat practical strategies for implementation, um, but also linking it into that research translation capacity that I've shown to you as, you know, you're a clinician, you get a, a gene, there's a whole heap of research that needs to be done as well in terms of defining how a disease works, uh, how a disease happens, let alone how we might treat it. So bringing all of those things together. So these are the members now of Australian Genomics. We started off with 40 institutions around the country, and now we have over 80 institutions involved. Uh, and it includes all the um, clinical and diagnostic, clinical services and diagnostic laboratories in genetics around the country, as well as our international partners. And we work quite closely with Genomics England and the Global Alliance. Um, what we've done through Australian Genomics is set up um, Australia has 25 million people, so we want it to function as one cohort of 25 million people. If I can't find another case of LMOD3 in the country, then we don't want the states to be divided as well because we're, you know, by fragmentation and duplication, um, we're really not going to make it on the world stage and we're going to waste a lot of time and effort and money. So by driving through patients with a variety of rare diseases and cancers, We've set up diagnostic and research networks across about 17 different diseases now around the country. We've piloted a national approach to how we federate and link data and then can link it uh, internationally. We've demonstrated its cost effectiveness, but also worked on a national approach to consent and ethics, um, and then looked at workforce and education, how we create uh, genomics literate clinicians. <coughs> 
Um, so these are some of the things we've achieved, you know, a national consent, um, now working very closely with government on how we get this paid for through either Medicare or state governments. Um, engaging out into the community because there's a public engagement process as well in terms of, um, of education. And we've got shared approaches now. There's talking the same language but um, getting everyone sharing the information in a similar way. We now have um, 30 active recruitment sites around Australia where there's ethics and governance and consent in place. And this initially took 18 months which again, if you're doing a research project, that's going to take up most of your research project. But uh, now that we've got this in place, from starting a new flagship to recruiting patients takes about two months um, just to get that all through and get the specific consent. So it's sort of enabling this happening around the country. Um, the, we've tied it in with a functional genomics network of over 200 labs around the country who, you know, then take a specific gene or variant and we'll model it, whether it's in um, a fish, the zebra fish, like I showed you before, or a mouse or a drosophila or a fly, um, in terms of looking at whether a particular variant is disease causing. Um, and then we've developed a, a national approach to how we link all of this information together um, and how we, it's also interoperable with other countries. Uh, and this is one thing we've developed, and I particularly like the name of this is Shariant, uh, which it just means as all the different labs, diagnostic labs around the country now are hooked up. They're talking the same language around variants and how they cause disease. Um, it's, it means that we don't need to do that twice once it's done and we've got the evidence, it's there for everyone to use. And then we're linking this in with um, Genomics England, with the major US initiatives, so it's building a knowledge base internationally. And just to give you some examples of this, from um, an example from rare childhood disorders, uh, what we did initially was we looked at standard diagnostic approaches. This was a study we started in 2013. Uh, and with standard approaches to diagnosis of kids presenting in the first year of life with severe intellectual or physical disabilities that were thought to be genetic in origin. We're getting one in 10, that 11% diagnostic rates at a cost per diagnosis of over $20,000. When we, in the same group of patients, added in a genomic test, we got a 58% diagnostic rate, so five times the diagnostic rate at a quarter of the cost. So this is now what we've taken to government to say, let us do this as standard of care because it makes so much sense and this is the economic case you need to make. 18 months later, now remember I told you about Eliza and Sarah's parents and how they were agonising about whether to have another child because of the risk. What we found here is for the families, the 50% of families, where we could give them the risk and also use um, and, and offer them prenatal diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, we then got lots of pregnancy, 48 pregnancies, uh, or lots of pregnancies in the next 18 months. But for those cases with no diagnosis, the parents elected not to have other children. So having a diagnosis and being able to use that information and know the risks and have availability of prevention resp restores reproductive confidence. And now in our hospital, we've seen how quickly can we do this. Um, and our goal has been if you've got a critically ill baby in intensive care. Think of Eliza and Sarah during that first, their first nine months of life. Is a diagnosis, how quickly can we get a diagnosis there that's going to be of use in knowing what to predict for the future um, and change management? So we've now, um, we've basically now drastically cut the times down to three days. So remember the first one took 13 years we can now provide a genomic diagnosis with a turnaround time of three days. Our diagnostic rate is over 50% and it changes the management of those critically ill babies in intensive care in three, quarter, three quarters of the time. So again, governments, we need to do this. It costs $12,000 for the test, but on one baby we saved about $500,000 in intensive care bed days. So this is, you know, thinking back from that time and when all, this all started, 
of that human genome to be able to do this with a three-day turnaround um, is quite amazing. The world record is 19 hours. So we're, um, we've probably got the best system turnaround time in the world, um, but we're aiming to get it quicker. So back to the world. Um, I think that this is Francis Collins, the human genome guy. This is Harold Varmus, who led the National Cancer Institute. This is Ewan Burney, who's um, the chair of the Global Alliance. And, and basically what um, we've launched is, you know, just acknowledging that there are going to be so much more, many more genomes available. Um, we really need to be pushing to share this data at scale. And this is a panel that I was on here. This is Sue Hill, who's the head of Genomics England. David Glazer, who's from Verily, which is an offshoot of Google, and he's the main bioinformatics person for all of us, which is the US Precision Medicine Initiative. And Heidi Ram, who um, works with the NIH ClinGen. And this is about how we now, across all of our major collaborative efforts, are sharing this information and making sure we're all talking the same language to share this data. And as I mentioned, one of my jobs is now bringing together all of these different countries. Um, we just had a meeting in May in London, um, which is when I was talking to you, Chris, I was on the way to that meeting, and we're coming up to Boston in October, of bringing the leads of all the countries together to make sure, again, that we're using appropriate standards so that we can share this data across country borders. The good news is that in um, the May budget, um, in uh, last year, our federal government um, had announced a $500 million boost um, in genomics research. Um, but a big part of that is also then still going to be how we get that into healthcare. So I'm very involved in, in this particular, um, particular initiative and our scientific strategy going forward, but it's a, it's a great government investment. So um, I think in the end, I, I just, shall I take, I've got about five minutes of just future, future gazing, I, pardon? Then questions, yeah, I don't want to miss time for questions. But I think this is just, you know, we're, I think we currently do newborn screening from protein testing. I think it will become a genomic test. Um, we're doing, diagno we're looking at, um, you know, ultra rapid genomic testing for undiagnosed disease. We're going to be applying it for looking at predispositions. Um, it's certainly being involved uh, in looking at uh, targeting therapies for cancer. Um, cancer. Also, whether there is hereditary cancer predisposition. Um, we're launching and actually doing a big study of reproductive carrier screening now. How can we prevent um, these disorders? And that's called McKenzie's mission, where we're going to screen um, over 10,000 couples for 1,500 genetic disorders um, to demonstrate whether we can prevent these kids having very, the very severe and disabling conditions. Um, and then, you know, there should be probably a genetic component to autopsy as well. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, applications through a whole lot of different areas. Um, but I think, remember I talked about the genetic hype. It's still not particularly useful in terms of a lot of different types um, of prediction. Because there are so many environmental factors and we're really going to need to pull in for the more common or complex disorders. You always get a family history taken when you go to the doctor about hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, the common killers. And so building all of that in with the environmental influences and complex disease I think is something that there's a lot of hype about, um, but I think it's far off in terms of being particularly useful. And what we're also looking at how we do now is, it's not just the genome, whoop, it's not just the genome, it's how you then look at how um, it's affecting your metabolism, the microbiome, which is the bugs that are living within us, um, and how it's affecting how you interact with the environment. So it's it's in more complex disease, uh, it's not so simple. There is also, from an ethical perspective, we've got the big pharma companies are now paying hundreds of millions of dollars investing in genomic information. And through Ancestry.com, many people are doing a cheek swab, getting their genome sequenced, um, and it's owned by companies in the US, such as 23andMe. 
and they are selling that data. Um, so the straight to consumer issue is, is a biggie. It's very different from me sitting for half an hour with a family getting informed consent about doing a genetic test on their baby who has a problem or on a person with cancer who needs that information to help guide their therapy. The, the straight to consumer testing is, is hugely different. Um, so the direct to consumer genomics versus what we're doing in clinical practice um, is still not really well linked together and this is not subject to the same sort of ethical um, and quality standards approach that we're taking within the health system. Then there's the absolute rubbish. So um, it's looking at your DNA to predict what you should be doing for diet, um, for your weight loss program, um, your fitness, and I'll talk a bit about that this afternoon when we talk about genomics and elite athletes. Um, nutrition, entertainment. You're a fun person and your DNA can be fun too. From finding your next bottle of wine to wearing a scarf, customised with your DNA. So, you know, you can see there's a bit of jumping on the bandwagon. But then from a serious point of view, the one thing I wanted to end on is now that we're sort of understanding and working our way through the genome, there's then the concept of editing the genome and gene editing. And we've been doing that with animals for a very long time. I mean, cows are bred to be big and meaty. Um, and in actual fact, this particular cow has a mutation in a gene called myostatin, which actually makes it double muscled. Um, we're using research to create super mice. I love this one, monogamous voles. We can genetically manipulate a vole to turn it from being polygamous to monogamous. Um, so there's all these things we've been doing in animal research for ages. And then um, there's also looking at how you might correct something like a, a thalassemia, which is a major um, mut mutation for blood disease in terms of a therapy. But this was the step too far last year in November when a Chinese scientist claimed to have edited the embryos of twins. Um, they're... I think their father had, oh, they were, what they manipulated was the gene um, that gave them a resistance to HIV, which he said, well, that's a good thing. But the problem, problem is that the ethics and consent to do this were, were poor. Um, it's still very highly experimental. It's really not known whether this technology you might be editing and aiming for one area, but... The problem is that we don't know what all the off-site effects might be, what other genes it might influence. Um, it's, you know, it was just, it's just such a great unknown and you cannot say that this is safe. Uh, and it's basically, and it's also something that will then get passed down to future generations of these children and long-term negative effects might not become apparent. But what this did do, this particular, um, particular event, um, really garnered the scientific community together around the world. Um, ethically, everyone came out and made a statement that this, this is illegal. Um, and I, I must say, this scientist disappeared um, off the radar, as did his institution, um, because it was really... Uh, it, it, we've got to be so careful that the ethics um, and the values about what we do, we have to make sure we don't overstep the mark, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I'm very excited about what um, we can then do, and we've, we've got a huge stem cell um, uh, initiative at the Murdoch inter at our institute in terms of then looking at how we can, but how we can gene edit um, stem cells and tissues from kids that have disorders um, to try and correct, correct it within that individual. And so I think all of this leads into, one, how we study disease, um, but also how we can reverse it and fix it, which I think um, within the medical setting, and this is just a beautiful photo of a, a kidney that we've made from a stem cell from someone's blood. Um, so we could take blood or skin from any of you guys and make little kidneys in a dish to study how your kidneys work. So I will end there, um, but uh, I'm really happy to take questions. In the time-honored fashion.